Good evening. My name is Bobette Mays and I am the chair of Neighborhood Advisory Committee. This is our first in-person meeting for a lot of you on this board. I think everybody here is your first meeting. So uh, welcome to you. We will now call this uh, meeting to order. Let me give you um, a brief overview. The committee set consists of nine members, all appointed by the city council with the representation from specific community sectors. Members shall be residents of the city or the city's extraterritorial zoning jurisdiction and shall reflect the uh, socio and economic diversity of Asheville. The term of office is three years. Number one, develop rules and bylaws for the conduct of its business, including but not limited to meeting schedules, officers, voting, and subcommittees. Number two, develop a plan to strengthen neighborhoods' identity and resilience and to facilitate communication and cooperation between Asheville's neighborhood and city offices. Three, develop benchmarks and standards by which progress towards implementing the plan can be measured. And four, work on special projects that are consistent with the goals of the committee as assigned as directed by the city council. Uh, we are all here live. We've been doing virtual, so some of us have not seen each other before, but um, we're here. I'm gonna go through the roll call and I'll let each person tell you who they are. I am the chair and I represent 28803 and 28704, which would encompass Shiloh and some parts of um, art in that area. Hi everybody, I'm Sharon Summerall. I'm vice chair and I represent 28805. I'm Carl Knight and I represent 28801. Lucius Wilson represent 28806. Peter Amsug, I'm at large and I live in 28805. My name's Elise Marder. I'm an at large member and I live in 28806. I'm Wendy Hainer, and I represent 28804. Um, Kim Roney, who is our liaison from the city council, she will be here at his expected time in maybe 30 minutes. And we're glad to have um, Kim Putnam from the Transportation with Traffic and Calming Policy and Process, and Sasha Vertusky and Ricky Hurley from Community and Economic Development Affordable Housing Division, Mobile Home, Ordinance change, that's a mouthful, <laughs> but it's good. We got through that. So I'd like for someone to give us a motion. I hope everyone has had a chance to see the draft of the last two, I think we had two months of meetings. If you've seen that, I need to get a motion on that, that uh, to approve those. I will make a motion to approve the two months meetings. Uh... I second. Okay, so we have a motion by Wendy and a second by Peter. Um, is there, are there any questions? If not, we'll do a roll call vote. Sharon? Aye. Peter? Aye. Elise? Uh, aye. Lucius? Aye. Carl? Aye. Did I miss anyone? Wendy. Wendy? Okay. Aye. And myself, aye. So it's approved as read. Uh, just kind of review the agenda for today's meeting. And um, if there's anything that you have any questions about or if there's something that should not be on there, just kind of briefly just look over it for a few minutes and let me know. And then we'll go on from there. Because we don't have to make a motion on that. Do we have any public comments? Um, there were none that came through the email or the voicemail line. Okay. Um, did you want to give an update, which Dava would give and uh, introduce our new staff member? I would be happy to do that. So hi, everybody. I'm Christina Israel. I'm the community engagement manager. It's so nice to see you all in person tonight. <laughs> and uh, I have very uh, glad tidings to share that uh, we have hired our new neighborhood services specialist and she's sitting right here and so I wanted to give Meredith a chance to just introduce herself to you all and uh, let you make all of your neighborhoods aware that um, she's here and she's here to support all of you so. Uh, thank you Christina. I'm Meredith Friedheim and I'm very excited to start in this position. This is my second week and it was an exciting first week 
Uh, I am an Asheville resident and live in uh, 28801 South Branch Broad neighborhood. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So excited to be here. Would anyone like to ask her any questions? Welcome. Thank you. Glad to see you. Yes. <laughs> it's good. Do we have, do you have anything that you wanted to give that Dawa was going to talk about? I'm trying to think if we talked about that in the meeting, the pre-meeting. I don't think that there was anything else we were planning to update on, unless unless I'm forgetting. Or okay. we can come back. To, I don't know okay, if you want to circle back, back when she gets here. Okay, so let's go to the um, unfinished business. Um, neighborhood volunteer. is. Did we finally close that up? Are we still working on that? <coughs> no, it was actually done by three of us. Um, and Mike Wasmer, uh, myself, and Christina, and Elizabeth. And uh, there were two people that we, there were a total of five um, on the applications, and of the five, we have chosen two. We're going to leave the other three on, and we would like to go back to the people that represented them and ask for more information about them <laughs> and how they have helped their neighborhoods, because it was kind of vague, the information that they um, um, put forth. So we have uh, two candidates that we are proposing for our um, volunteer spotlight. And the first one is Lee Arvin. And the other one is Mike, did you catch his last name? Michael Stratton, and there were actually three. three. Oh, okay. The, the third one was Angela Young. Okay. So um, geographically, Michael Stratton's in the Oakley neighborhood. And Lee Arabian's in um, Grove Park, Sunset Mountain and Angela Young is in Hillcrest. So we wanted to spotlight all three of those folks for this first um, quarterly spotlight. So those are the three that you have decided on? Those are the three? Those were the three that, three decided, that, on. that you decided on? Yes. Let me ask a question. Who is the third person? I didn't hear that. Her name is Angela Young, and she's in the Hillcrest. So just for my clarity, this is the final decision on the three, or is it just the three that you have that you're going to make just was, one? This would be a decision to spotlight all three of them. You're going to do all three? Yeah. So that means that, um, I guess that would be something that we'll talk about at the retreat, because in the, we've only been able to spotlight one mm -hmm. in the past. So okay. that would be something that we'll talk about next month. Well, and we were going to move to the quarterly, so spotlighting. Um, two or three was what we said we would spotlight every three months. And then the and then the volunteer of the year award. So did we vote on that? Did we vote on it or was it just a recommendation? I think recommendations at this point. Okay. So that's what we'll um, let's just remember to put that down for the retreat that we'll do a final discussion. And what I'd like to do is uh, have a summary for each of the three that we propose to give to the uh, committee so we can all view that at one time. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Sounds pretty good to me. Okay, so our new business, we do have our guest, and so we're going, and we've made sure that we want to give you plenty of time so that you could tell us everything that we needed to know, and if we did not know something, we'll be able to ask, so we've shortened down our time so that we know it's time conscious and everybody, so we're going to, so Ken Putnam, are you going to go first? Sure. All right, then. Oh, did we want to go back and let Dawa talk first? Oh, that's fine. Dawa, come on. I'm going to yield to Dawa. Yeah. Dawa, everybody yields to Dawa. No, She's no. special. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm special, but I am certainly happy to be here and to see everybody in person. It's wonderful to see you all. And I, I apologize. I was stuck at a soccer game. We won. Go Rams. <laughs> um, and now I'm here in present. Is there something I needed to go over from earlier in the meeting? Just whatever that uh, you would think that if it's anything that's going on that we needed to discuss or, you know, just act, different activities. She's already, she introduced Samaria, so we know that she's here. But if there are any updates or staff activities. 
I don't think so. Our, our big great news is certainly having Meredith on board, and we're really happy to be fully staffed. Uh, it's, been, it's been a real stretch these last two years. So I know she's hit the ground running, and she's got an amazing uh, guide. She really gets settled into her new position in Christina, who also, not too long ago, hit the ground running. Um, and then just look forward to giving some updates on the ARPA project, the Accessible and Inclusive Government Project at the council, at the NAC retreat here in a month. Okay. So still working on pulling that together and uh, we're, we're scoping that out and we'll have some great information to share with you all and uh, hopefully get some good input on how NAC can stay plugged into that effort. Okay. Anybody have any questions? We're going to proceed. Now you can come, Mr. Porter. I hate to make you get up and down like a... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Putnam, and I'm the director of the Transportation Department. <clears throat> and tonight, I just want to share some information with you all about the traffic calming policy. I want to try to keep it informal, and uh, and at the end, I'll be glad to answer any, any questions. But the city has had a traffic calming policy since 2004. And this is for the, it's, it's a neighborhood traffic common policy. It's only applicable to residential streets, whether it's a local street or a collector street. And that happens to be most of the streets that we have in the city. Uh, we maintain a little over 400 miles of streets and the majority of those would be residential. Um, then the policy was changed a little bit in 2008 and the city council decided at that time in order to acknowledge that we had limited resources, so to try to get this policy out to all the neighborhoods that we could, they decided to say limit the traffic calming devices to only speed humps or speed cushions. And that could either be the asphalt ones that we typically use, and you've probably seen them on some of the streets, or it could be the boat down kind that have been tested in other areas but we haven't tried those here yet. The policy is very specific about what streets it can cover. So one of the things, there's a couple of triggers that have to occur. Once we do a study, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but once we do a study and determine what the 85th percentile speed is, and what that is, that means 85% of the cars driving up and down a road are going at a certain speed or slower. If that speed is more than five miles higher than the speed limit, then that criteria would allow us to go to the next step to see if speed humps or speed cushions would be warranted. <coughs> uh, another criteria, because there's two reasons that you put in traffic calming. You either want to slow people down or you want to try to encourage cut through traffic to use a different road and not your residential street. So another trigger is if your street happens to have more than a thousand cars a day on it, then that would help move it to the next step to, to consider the, the, whether speed humps or speed cushions would work. We used to have a 40% petition. So once we'd get a request, we'd have to do a petition of the of affected residents and say, we got a request to study this street for traffic calming. Do you agree with that? Do you want us to move forward? And if 40% or more of the people said yes, then we'd move forward. But that, that's been taken away. We, we City Council uh, changed that in 2014, so you don't have to worry about that one anymore. But when we get to the point where traffic uh, devices are warranted, then there has to be a 60% petition to move to the construction phase. So a petition is set up, we set it up, we create it, and then we just ask the neighborhood to go out and get the signatures. And all they have to do is get 60% of the people to sign it and then we can move forward with that. And then uh, another thing that was added in 2014 is that if we get to that point and the residents want to pay for part of the construction phase to make sure it's gonna happen, then we, we can do that, but we've got Right now, we've got the money to take care of the ones that we can get into that far. So that's, we haven't had to do that with any neighborhood yet. Now to spend a little bit more time on the process, and this policy is easily available on the website, 
but what I'll do is tomorrow I'll furnish copies to Christina so that she can get it directly into your hands as far as the copy of the policy and then the notes that I've got here to show you the process because I think in your roles it'll be important for you to share that information with your neighbors and so forth because it, it really helps to have a you know a concerted effort when you're trying to work with us on this. Now what triggers this is the transportation department will receive a request. Most of the time we get it through email. There's other means, phone calls, so forth, but usually it's an email. It doesn't ha it can be from one person or a group of people. And that's what triggers it. And so we'll look at that request. We'll look at the street, whatever street it was. We'll make sure, have we done this study before? Or is this a first time? We'll, we'll schedule the counts. We do it. We do, traffic counts and a speed study at the same time. It's a 72 hour study that we do. Most of the time we do it on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. So it's consecutive. We're trying to find 72 hours in a row that we can get all that information on how many cars are going up and down the road. Each hour is broken out <clears throat> and how fast are they going? One of the things that we can do with that report is we can share it with the police department and say, hey, here's a street that we see that there's a, a concentration of speeders at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday. And then even though they have limited resources, they then more easily send someone there on a Wednesday at three o'clock rather than trying to cover the whole 72 hour period of time. Now, that's the way we typically do it. It depends on the street and the conditions and so forth. So some, a group of people may say to us, well, the speeding problem is more prevalent on the weekends. So we can adjust that and do the study like a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we work individually with each request on that. So once we get that data after it's scheduled, then we'll analyze it and then we'll determine if it meets any of those triggers. Is the 85th percentile speed, is it greater than, than the uh, posted speed limit? If a street is not posted, then that automatically <clears throat> means the speed limit is 35 anywhere in the city. Most of the signs that we have posted in the residential area, residential areas, most of that speed limit is 25 miles an hour. And there are others that are 20 miles an hour. But those are the, usually 25 is what we land on. But again, it's all based on the conditions along the road. We, we look at not only the traffic counts, but how many driveways there are, how many intersections there might be, uh, is there on-street parking or not, all these other factors play into it. Are there sight distance issues? Are there sidewalks? So once we get to that point and we're still moving forward and another check, and we do this early on in the process. Now we're always going to get the counts because we like to keep a record of all the traffic counts and the speeds on a given road so we can go back in time and, and look and see how many times we've done it before and is the traffic growing or is it staying stabilized. But we also look at the grade of the road. Is, is the road flat? Can't find too many of those in Asheville, right? But how steep is the grade? And if, this, if the steepness of the grade is more than 8%, that's a major red flag, and in most cases, we can't proceed with a speed hump or speed cushion because it would cause other safety issues and even drainage issues. But let's assume we get past all that. The, the final step that we do before we could get to the petition process would be go to the fire department. They have to analyze it and tell us if their standard of coverage in responding to calls is going to be negatively impacted or not. And there was a time when we started this, many streets, it did not affect the standard of coverage. But, and what that means is how fast does the fire department respond to a 911 call? And a lot of times we automatically think it's they're going to a fire. No, most of their car calls, they're going to a medical emergency. So time is of the essence. So if they give us the, the green light, so to speak, that says their standard of coverage is fine on this road, it won't be impacted, then we can move forward with a speed hump. If they come back and say it's negatively impacted, then we can move forward with a speed cushion. 
And the difference is the speed hump goes across the entire road from pavement edge to pavement edge and everybody in both directions would slow down. The speed cushion is instead of having one that goes all the way across, there are two smaller ones in each lane so that the fire truck can stay to the right and straddle that. They won't, it won't slow them down at all. But a car, even if they try to straddle it, one, set, one side of their car is gonna be up and not, and, and not. We don't have too many streets with these devices in yet. We've got a contract that's gonna start probably in two weeks that all four streets are speed cushions. And we're gonna see how well that works and we, we get the fire department to test them out for us. So once we get that 60% petition, and, and like I say, we prepare it for you so that you don't have to worry about that. We, we give a spokesperson on that street a copy of it. They can, and if it's more than one page, you know, they could break it apart and pass it out. We had one Riverview Drive several years ago that had 125 homes that had to be contacted, and they did it in one weekend. So it's something they could do. A lot of them, though, you're, you're, there's probably 20 properties you have to go to or maybe 50 or something like that. But we could set that up for you, even give you a little map, show you where this, the speed hump or the speed cushion is going to be. So when you talk to your neighbor, you can just show them, show them that. We can provide additional copies as well. And then we get a list of them, and we're, we're trying to do at least one traffic calming project every year. Um, I haven't looked at the price of this latest one that we're doing. We know it's higher because of what's been going on with the prices all around, but we got back a local contractor that's done it before. So we're very confident that the work's gonna happen uh, very good and very professionally. Once that goes to contract, um, this whole contract with the four different streets will probably be done if the weather holds in two weeks or less. Where is that going to be done? One of them is on Stoner Road in Oakley. Another one is Mitchell Avenue in um, West Asheville. And then the other two are in the Klein Dot, Klein Dot Dyke, Klein Dyke. Klein Dyke community uh, at the end of Montford. So I said a lot. Any questions? Thank you for coming out and helping us on MLK. Um, with the traffic calming um, strips to count for our uh, analysis. Have you done that yet? I don't run up and down MLK that much. I'll have to check for you on that. I know that you had sent the information in. I do remember that. And do you want me to send you an email and uh, just as a you? Yes, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. But sure. thank you for coming out and uh, basically holding my hand and telling me how it needed to be done. I really appreciate your time, Mary and Chris's time. And I'll digress for just a second. The, uh, the, the traffic signal at the end of South Charlotte and Martin Luther King, that's proceeding well. Uh, at City Council, um, first meeting in October, they will approve the agreement uh, for the DOT will review the plans and be ready to do the inspection work. And then we'll be able to move to the construction phase. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Putnam. I'm Wendy Hainer, and I'm at 28804 North okay. Asheville. Mm -hmm. And I have been deluged with comments about the road diet scheduled for Merriman Avenue. I know you're addressing the main, uh, the side roads and not really the major road like Merriman is going to be, but uh, Norwood Park um, from Beaver Lake, uh, they are really up in arms. They're finding ways to get around Merriman. They're going to do a lot of shortcuts. One of them is going to be um, Edgewood Road. Another one's going to be Farwood Road. Another one is Evelyn. And the other one is Graceland. And they're going to be converging back onto Kimberly and trying to get off of the diet because there's a lot of areas where the road is going to be really tight, where you've got Ace Hardware, you've got the ABC store, you have Wells Fargo, you have um, 
turning on to Lakeshore Drive. These, all these areas are really very, very congested as we are at the present time. And the neighborhoods associations in these areas are feeling that this is just gonna push more traffic into these neighborhoods to try to get away from the deluge that's happening on Merriman. And I wanted to know how is that going to be addressed? Uh, are you going to start looking at the road diets on all these individual little roads like Farwood and Graceland? And even though we've got some of them already in place, we're going to have to have more because the traffic is going to be heavier. I, I'm just really all very, these people are very concerned about this. And they feel like the bicycles already have uh, Kimberly and why do they need Merriman to make this happen? And these are just questions that are coming mm -hmm. up in discussions as um, uh, the people are calling. Um, Midland Road at the beginning of Beaver Lake to Weaver Boulevard, that's a long stretch uh, of area. That's a huge, I mean, they're even, uh, they're concerned about Luella's Barbecue and Coleman Avenue and and going down to W.T. Weaver, how are you going to be able to do that with one lane in the center and hopefully there's not another car coming in and another car going the other way and then there's going to be a lots of wrecks. And this is, so I'm just wondering, how are you going to address all this? Is, is this is just going to be a, a mess? Well, we don't think so. I know you don't. Uh, but... The, the thing, the, uh, the, the road diet is really not about bike lanes. The road diet is a proven uh, measure to improve safety on the road for all users. And one of the things that we're trying to do because of city council policy and direction is we're trying to make our roads usable for all users, pedestrians, transit, bicycles, cars. And, and so that's, that's that premise. Now, this is a partnership with the DOT and the city of Asheville because Merriman Avenue is a DOT road. It's, right. it's a U.S. highway. Uh, you may have seen traffic counter tubes and so forth out. You may have seen people out counting intersections. Mm -hmm. The DOT is getting a lot of before data so that we can compare it to the after data when the road is completed. We're doing the same thing. We're getting counts on Kimberly this week, just to give us a baseline. We've done other intersections. Uh, um, I know we've done Farwood. I, I believe we've done Edgewood already. We've done Graceland. at least. Graceland, has that been done? I'm not sure if Graceland's been done or not, but we're, we're trying to get all that we can on that to see what's gonna change. Now, I will say that anytime something else is done, it's a change, there is a, a period of time that everybody will have to get used to what's going on. And um, I don't know how long that'll take, but we're all prepared to uh, try to address it. But that's what the approach that we're taking. This was not something that we just decided to do on a whim. So this two was... things came to uh, my attention. One of them was pertaining to Charlotte Street, where the road diet is already in place. Mm -hmm. uh, an 18-wheeler could not move into... Um, I jet arrays to unload or the taco um, shop. And they ended up parking the 18 wheeler in the road where you would turn on either side. They're stuck in the middle and no one could get around them to get up to the, the roads. And the 18 wheeler was right there trying to unload. And that was uh, no, no um, police or anybody. And it was just chaotic. Another thing uh, that we had recently is the uh, multimodal. Um, they had asked for someone to come and sit at Kimberly and Evelyn and um, where they're watching the traffic and the cars that are running the red lights and the number of bicycles that are coming through that area. And they wanted to find out if there was a way for North Carolina, I realize, and I've tried to explain it, that it's the state has to approve this, but they are really looking at putting cameras in for uh, speed, help the police in some way to catch the ones that are running these red lights and speeding, especially on Kimberly and Evelyn. And 
the gentleman that was working with the uh, multimodal uh, committee, he was sitting there and he had a huge uh, graph paper and checking up all this that was happening with the bicycles and the cars and the number of cars. They're concerned about the cars running red lights because the bicycles are coming through and they're not stopping and they're going to cause an accident with the bikes. I just see this just, I'm overwhelmed with it. The people that are calling and asking if I know of anything or any suggestions and it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very um, concerning for our zip code of 28804. And I just wanted to, this was a perfect opportunity to bring this to your attention sure, and, I appreciate and let that. you know how the community and they feel like maybe there's not enough public input. And that's one of the things they kept on saying over and over and over again. So thank you so much for sure. allowing me to Sure, absolutely. No, that, that's fine. And I would say you're, you're, you're right that uh, red dot cameras and even speed cameras are not allowed in North Carolina unless there's special legislation to allow the given city to do either one. Charlotte is the only city that I know that had test, have tested the speed limit cameras. Uh, and they did it for a year or so. I can't remember exactly how long, but uh, they've abandoned that. You get uh, over to Tennessee and they're all over. The, the, whole air, the whole state is covered with them. Speed limit cameras or red light cameras? Both. Okay, because I've never seen anywhere that's got the, the speed limit cameras. Yeah. But the red light cameras, um, certain cities in, in North Carolina have tried them. Uh, the difficult thing is that um, a given city, like if we were to do it and we were to contract with some vendor to do it for us, the only thing that we could keep out of all that is an administration fee, not to exceed 10%. And then the vendor would get whatever cut they're supposed to get based on their contract, and the rest of the money goes to the school system. And so it's, uh, it's very difficult for a given city to take that on because a lot of times the administration might cost more than 10%. It, it seems to me um, personally that it would help our police um, not having to worry about what's going on behind their back and having a lot of things solved. Mm -hmm. and especially um, a lady got her, her dog was run over the other day. Uh, she, she was ha walking on Kimberly and um, at the red light of Evelyn and, and it was a red light and her dog was on a lead and the dog got hit by a car that was running red light. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate this information. Um, I'm from, uh, I represent the community. I'm in Shiloh. Okay. And uh, we do have some concerns. Um, I think that some people don't believe that Rock Hill Road going through Oakland is part of Shiloh, but it is. And we've, we've had an influx of traffic that has come through there, especially early in the mornings or in the evening, people getting out of work because they use that as a way of not having to hit Sweden Creek and Hendersonville because mm -hmm. that is, it becomes, it's impacted with just a lot of traffic. What I think that the people on the street, and I live on, I live off of Rock Hill Road too, but I think the thing that's disparaging to them is when they saw that in Oakley, there were speed bumps and um, stop signs that you know, would reduce the speed of traffic. Because we've got the, uh, I think the speed limit signs are up, but people really don't pay that attention. And I think that you did come and mark the streets with the yellow double lines so people wouldn't cross. But that's still not ha helping because they're still going around corners and then we have people, um, new developers that are coming in. But I did not realize that was a process for that mm -hmm. uh, because it is very concerning because, uh, like she said, a friend of, of ours that he had his dog on the lead and someone hit the dog and kept going. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we do have those problems. Our people still like to walk with their the animals and their kids, you know, and with people coming so fast around the corner and a lot of things they can't see. So I don't know whether it would be good to put mirrors up because there are a lot of hidden driveways, but I don't know who would be responsible for putting up the, the mirrors so that you could see that a car was coming out 
or how do we need to slow down the process because we need something. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've sat in my neighbor's yard one day and somebody came around the corner and they came so fast that they ended up flipping over to the mm -hmm. other side on the other side of the road because they don't look at the um, speed limit signs. So that was that's that concern. So I think that maybe I'll probably have to shoot somebody an email and get that so that to get that process started. Sure. Because we didn't know, I did not know that that's what we had to do. And I'm assuming you're not talking about the section of Rock Hill between Hendersonville Road and Sweet Creek. You're talking about On the this. other side yes. of Rock Hill Road that people come in through mm -hmm. Oakley. Mm -hmm. And I noticed today when I was getting ready to come here that it was so much traffic that it slowed. It was slowed down because it was so many cars. So you just should get the email. Okay. And then the second thing was um, the neighborhood has a very uh, huge concern about the Ingalls Market in South Forest that's getting ready to expand Okay. with a gas station. And uh, they're thinking that it's going to be so much traffic coming through. And I've talked to... Um, I think one of the guys from uh, Ingalls, the community kind of wanted to have a, a red light at um, Jeffries and Hendersonville Road. Not really that great because of how narrow the road was, but mm -hmm. if it was a possibility, they wanted that. And if that couldn't be done, the other option would be over on Forest Street. Uh, because when people come down off of that, where that CVS is and the fire department, and they come, they got a good roll all the way down mm -hmm. to Ingalls. So there needs to be a way to slow up the traffic so people can get in and out on those side streets. So that was a concern of theirs. Okay. That project, of course, is under review now. Okay. They are required to do a traffic impact study, which we haven't received yet. Uh, as far as any decision for a traffic signal, where you were describing, mm -hmm. which the main road would be Hendersonville Road. Since that's a DOT road, they're the ones that have to make that decision um, and, and so forth. But if if you include in your email, you don't have to do two separate ones. If you'll just tell me a little bit about that, then I can get that information to the right person. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> This is, I could probably follow up with you afterwards in the email as well. Sure. But around the Grant Center and Walton Street and Livingston and Oakland, is there anything in the making right now as opposed, you know, concerning speed bumps or other improvements going on with the big development? As far as Livingston, there is a, there's a, there's a project that's been in the works for quite some time, and I don't know if we've got all the funding yet, but that project was going to uh, put traffic calming of some type on Livingston. Okay. Depot Street, there's a, a greenway project that we've got that's going to have, won't have the traditional speed humps or speed cushions, but there were going to be some raised pedestrian crossings associated with the greenway trail system and along Depot Street and some of that area. Do you know how far up Depot Street? Is it going to go past the Grant Center by chance? Because there's yes. a tremendous amount of people that live in those apartments and the housing yes. over there. Um, and our biggest concern is the speed with a lot of kids mm -hmm. walking to the high school uh, or other people that work in the hospital. And it's just super... Um, it's heavily populated, but there are not very safe sidewalks, and there's not a single speed right. whatsoever. And it, it might be best for us to beat offline at some point in time, Absolutely. too. Uh, and we'll be glad to do that. We could even meet you on site or uh, if you want to come to our office. Uh, I know that we've found that on uh, Oakland, speed humps are warranted. And they're going to be included in our next contract, hopefully in the spring. Because we've already got the petition back on it, I think. Wonderful. Um, we have signed, at, at, I'm a Walton Street resident, we've signed two petitions in the last three years and have had no feedback from anybody until I got on this committee. Yeah. So I, I just was just sharing that as a. Sure, and we can research that. The, the last three years have been kind of crazy for yeah, yeah. a lot of people. So I won't stand up here and say that something hadn't slipped through the cracks. I hear you. But yeah, I would love to follow up with you. Okay. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I just had a couple of questions following up for your, from your presentation. Um, when you talk about the 60% petition, 
um, and they survey residents. I mean, we have a lot of renters in this mm -hmm. town. So are you surveying the actual tenants who live in the house? Yes, ma'am. The property owners? Okay. Yes, and to clarify that, because a lot of times what we've found in Asheville is a lot of those owners may not even live in Asheville. Right. And they may be out of state. Yeah. And so, yes, what we're trying to do, if you think about it, is we're just having the neighbor walk along the street and knock on someone's door. So, yes, that's that's what it is. So we we it's it's either one. Okay. And um, when you're talking about scheduling these uh, traffic studies, first you go back to see if you've done one already. Um, but obviously, as time passes, you might need to conduct another one. Yes. So like. Uh, would you, if you've done one a year ago versus two years ago, like how, at what point would you say, okay, let's repeat this? We have to look at that on a case by case basis, but in general, we, we don't, we don't have a thing that says that uh, if we, it had to be so long, right. I mean, we're still coming out of COVID. So pretty much, even if we had done one during COVID, when with the traffic volumes were lower, we would expect then we would have no issue doing that one now to see what it looks like today. Okay. So again, those are the criteria we kind of follow, but we, we're very flexible in trying to work with the community to make sure we're getting all the data that we need to come up with the, the answer. Right. Now, I can't guarantee you that the answer is always going to be one you like. Certainly. I mean, the data is neither good or bad. It right. just is what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and another question on the scheduling and like conducting the traffic studies, like how how long, what's the timeline for that look like? Are we talking about like, okay, we want to schedule one and it takes a year to conduct it or like a couple months? Well, it's not up to a year yet. It's, okay. it's, a, it's, it's anywhere from a 60 to a 90 day process. We have one staff member that goes out virtually every single week to put out the, the count tubes that we have. And then that person, you remember, we leave them out there. They put them out on a Monday, pick them up on a Friday. Right. We're trying to get that 72 hours. So they're, they're out there for the whole week. And um, then he's got to download all the information and run the calculations. And you might be doing that on several streets, all oh, in one week? They're, they're all, they're, yes, that's true. Now, this week, we, we put them all out on Kimberly. Now, the main thing we're trying to get for that is, of course, what's the traffic volume? We want to know what the traffic volume is this week. And then we can compare it to what we've done years back. And then hopefully we'll have a good idea of, of if, we, if we start seeing increases right away, we can say, oh, that's because people are try, trying to get over there for avoid merriment. And then um, you were saying that the steepness of the grade sometimes make roads ineligible for mm -hmm. the speed reduction devices. Like what percentage of roads do you think, or what percentage of requests do you think that's the, that's the X that, that in, invalidates it? I really can't answer yes. that, but, but well, I'll give you an example. We just got a recent request. I think this is in North Asheville too. Uh, we just got a recent request on a given street that supposedly everybody that rides a skateboard wants to ride it. And they go down there and there's been examples of they've hit people's cars and all this kind of stuff. Well, obviously, if they're on the road, I haven't, I haven't been on the road yet. But if, the, if that's a road that probably exceeds that 8%. So even if we wanted to, we could not put a speed hump on a road like that. But we may come up with something else that we could do. But sometimes when we come up with a solution, an engineering solution, it might cause some unintended consequences, like it, it might be too noisy when cars hit it, like a rumble strip, as an example. And you know, you don't know necessarily want to see that in your residential community. But something like that might stop what you're trying to get stopped. The hill bombing by the skateboarders. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have to move on. Okay. Okay. We appreciate all the information you've given us, and uh, we will make sure that we will get in contact with you. I know you all are going to talk to him offline. Um, maybe if you get his email.
just leave it for them also, so that if they want to email yep. you about certain things. I'll leave some cards over here on the table, okay? Okay. That's fine. Thank and, you. Uh, but again, we're here to help you all serve the community that okay. you're in charge of. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Chair Mays, could I just, one, before Ken leaves, I, I know that this is something that we hear a lot about and there's a lot of um, confusion around. Ken, could you take just a minute and talk a little bit more about all of the things that must be taken into consideration before a solution can be applied. I'm thinking specifically about standard of cover and how that can sometimes be a limiting factor for traffic calming solutions in neighborhoods. Yes, and I did, did quickly mention that, but again, the, the fire department has a minimum amount of time that they're trying to achieve to respond to a call. And if we put a speed hump on a given road, every speed hump would take away 10 seconds of extra time for the fire truck to arrive at the scene. But when you think about it, it's not just the street that we're trying to decide if speed humps or speed cushions could go on. It's the route they take and it's the surrounding streets around there. And as, as we continue to study areas and continue to put down more speed humps and or speed cushions, then we're increasing the likelihood that one day we may reach a time where the fire department has to say enough is enough, can't, can't do anymore. Now in the Monford community as an example, uh, there's a brand new fire station being built on Broadway. Well, once they do that, obviously the standard of cover will really be much improved when they start going to calls in that area. So that might open up other streets in Montford that up to this point in time have been ineligible for traffic comping. It might allow certain streets then to be eligible for it. Did that help? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sasha Vertunsky. We're ready. We're ready for you. Thank you. Um, good evening, Commission members. Um, my name is Sasha Vertunsky, and I am the Affordable Housing Officer now for the City of Asheville, and I'm in Community Economic Development. I was in planning for almost eight years prior to that, and five years even longer ago than that. <laughs> And I'm here with Ricky Hurley, who's our zoning administrator, and he's also our plan, plans review <coughs> coordinator. So he's over the planners down in development services. And if there's one person who knows our code in this city, it's Ricky Hurley. So I'm giving this presentation, but if you have detailed questions, he's here to back me up and not keep me from saying anything wrong. So as you may know, um, manu we're talking about manufactured homes tonight. And... Let me just say, in 1997, when we, when the city of Asheville adopted the UDO, the Unified Development Ordinance, it really limited, I think, I don't know all the history, but it limited where manufactured homes or mobile homes could be. And there's some overlay districts and manufactured home park <laughs> districts, and we're really not here to get into all those details because we're not suggesting any big changes to that, so. So just a few key takeaways. So this is a small change, incremental <laughs> change that we're hoping to make that will address the replacement of manufactured homes where they previously existed. And I'll go through, we'll go through a quick example. Um, and this change will stop the slow attrition of affordable housing that are desperately, it's desperately needed in our community. Um, we've got a few other small updates in this package. And we don't think that any of these changes will have any noticeable effects in neighborhoods and we're here to inform you, answer any questions you might have, and collect any comments you might have. And I'll talk about our next steps towards the end. So here's the real nugget. The, the basically, our UDO language prevents the replacement of lawfully established, this is a lot of words, manufactured homes in a park. So unless you replace it within 180 days, which is six months. Um, so, for example, there might be a mobile home park, a manufactured home park, and somebody leaves and moves and takes their home. And if that park owner does not get a mobile home in there in six months, they lose that spot forever. 
So what we're trying to say is we should kind of get rid of this. It's kind of a bureaucratic, it was, it may have been intentional in the UDO, but it's a way to slowly get rid of mobile homes in our community. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of opinions about mobile homes. We're not here to kind of get into that, but, um, in, and we have here almost in every instance, they have an address, they have utility services, you know, everything is in place for somebody to live there. And as you probably know, this is one of the most affordable ways to live in our community. So we would allow replacement of those homes in, the, in manufactured housing park spaces, allow, you know, within 365 days within a qualified overlay district, and that's not in a park. So that's, this is where Ricky comes in if I start to, because you can get confused very fast. Um, <clears throat> for any other zoning areas, just leave that six month period alone. We're not proposing any changes there. Um, and it will not allow the expansion of mobile home parks. So we're not really, unless you were already legally able to expand a mobile home park, we're not trying to expand the use. So um, along some of the smaller changes is there's a definition change. The state, you know, made some big changes in 160D, which is the big planning part of the general statutes. And I think we, I don't know if it was a part of that, but we have not kept up with state definition. So we just want to adopt the state definition of manufactured housing. And for whatever reason, we had campers and trailers and travel trailers kind of as a part of that definition. And we're going to take that out. So it's just kind of cleaning up our ordinance a little bit. And Ricky added this slide. I think it's helpful just to, for some folks get confused about all these different building typologies. So, you know, we have recreational vehicles which are not built to North Carolina building code, right? So they're built to an RV industry association standard. Then we have manufactured homes, which are not also not built to North Carolina building code. They're built to a housing a HUD code, HUD standards. So when they, you know, they'll have like a, that's almost like a metal, I don't know what you would call that, but it's, you know, it's a stamp on the mobile home or the manufactured home. So it's, you know, it's been inspected, it's safe, it's designed to certain standards. And what, from what I've heard, you know, those standards have really increased over the years and they're much, those manufactured homes are much better quality than they were 20 years ago. And then we have modular homes, which are built towards North Carolina building code and they're treated as stick built. And so a modular home, you might have one in your neighborhood in Asheville. They're pretty, I think they're here and there. Um, and you might not even know that it's modular unless you saw it come in on the trailer, mm -hmm. right? So, so here's the table of uses. We don't have the manufactured housing overlay or the, or the manufactured housing community overlay in the table, so it's just adding it in there. Again, kind of a cleanup thing. And then we had some language in the UDO about age of manufactured homes um, and Basically, North Carolina said you can't have this age language in your standards. So we're just getting in line with North Carolina. There was a certain date at which HUD started having those standards. Housing and Urban Des Development had started having standards for manufactured homes. I want to say it was like 1976. So a lot of cities used to have this age standard. And really what it was trying to get to is like they didn't want the really old ones that were before those new standards came into effect. Does that make sense? So we thought we'd just show you a few maps. What we have here in black is basically, um, according to the Buncombe County records, they have a land use code for every piece parcel in the city. So there's a land use code that indicates there is a manufactured home on the property. It could be one manufactured home on a five acre parcel. It could be two on, you know, you know this is, does not really give you any kind of idea of how many homes we're talking about. It's just more where they are. So this is East Asheville. And you can see that once you get out, the great area is Buncombe County. So you can see that once you get outside the city, there's so many more than there are in the city because the city does have pretty strict rules about them. This is the Oakley and Shiloh district areas. And that kind of larger black area down there is several, I think it's a several different parks near Rock Hill Place and Rock Hill Circle, just for orientation. Uh, this is Sand Hill Road, West Asheville. Um, 
there's more as you move out towards the county. So as, you know, as the city annexed property over the years, they probably took in more than they did have originally. Again, you can see in Buncombe County to the north and to the south and the west, there's a lot more in the county. And then this is South Asheville. Um, so here's an example. So here is a manufactured housing park. I believe it's in Oakley. And so I think, I don't see any that are actually missing, but so if you can imagine one of those homes was removed and they didn't replace it within six months, they will never be able to put it back again today. So what we, we just want to change that so they could put it back. So we don't think that there'll be tremendous impacts on traffic. It's a car that was already there before, um, if that makes sense. Does anybody have any questions about that before I keep going? So our next steps, and we'll, you can think about it, we, we can talk. Uh, our next steps are to go to planning and zoning next week, and we have a draft ordinance um, just making these exact same changes I've told you about, and then we would go to city council on October 25th. I will say that, um, just so you all know, the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee, which is a committee that I am a liaison to, they're very interested in changing the rules around manufactured housing um, and trying to be more allowing of that in our, throughout our community. That's, that's a whole um, another can of worms that we're not ready quite to open up with because we have so many other things on our work plan that we have to do first. And that would take a lot of community conversation and talking to people and really, that's a deep subject. So this is just a very small change overall and not, we don't think it's a huge impact. Did I miss anything? No, <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or concerns or Shane? Hey, Sasha, um, this is a good idea. I mean, it's, we need more affordable housing and this is a good way to provide it. Um, are, like the Oakley Manufacturing Park, is that actually in a qualified overlay district? Do you have to make an overlay district in order for these parks to qualify, so every park we have in the city is sitting in the qualified overlay district? I don't believe so. I mean, I think how it is right now is that, this is where you have to correct me, like I think when the UDO came into effect, some parks, I don't know if all parks were put into those districts or not. No. So there are some parks that are not in those districts. Hmm? Most of them are not. Most of them are not. Well, you change the zoning to make it so, so that, I mean, is there a reason to have uh, an overlay, uh, uh, qualified overlay district? I mean, is there a reason to even have that? Yeah, so that's what me and Sasha was talking about. We don't know why certain parks were not zoned with the overlay district. Um, so we'll, let me see if we're back, Sasha. Yeah, I was left there, left there. Um, so like these in East Asheville, uh, the Hall Creek area, the only one that is in an overlay district I see is in the far right hand. Uh, there's a little bit of a hatching in that area. We don't know. I mean, the parks are what they are, sort of like you are what you are, and you can continue to exist as a non-conforming use. So as long as they continue to operate, they can continue in perpetuity. It's just that the way the code's written today, it was like pulling one or two out of the time, just when somebody would forget to replace it. So, yeah. Uh, so maybe I didn't answer your question fully, Sharon, but go ahead and restate it. Well, what I was saying is like an overlay district to me is a broader, it doesn't take you just one item. It takes in many different zoning in an overlay district it, from my experience with overlay districts. Yeah. So are we just using this uh, manufacturing home only to a boundary that manufacturing home and it doesn't take three blocks over or half a mile over? No, no. It, it doesn't change the underlying zoning or the, or the overlay. And, and, and I think we're trying to do a, a very small technical change because if we were to apply an overlay district like the mobile home community overlay, you have to be in that overlay, the mobile home community overlay, to even begin a park, to even create a park. So the parks like we see here, if there's three or four houses on those parcels, they cannot expand at all. So even with this change, we cannot let them expand at all. They can't add a fifth mobile home. There's no way to do it. They would only be able to swap out one for one. And if they had some sort of like septic line issue, utility issue, and 
had to remove a mobile home for you know a year because to take care of the business they need to take care of then they can know assuredly that the city will reissue that permit for that mobile home to go back because we're looking at the overall park as a non-conforming use and not that individual unit so Does yeah we're sense? so we could get rid of the overlay district or just continue no, the, the, using it no we'll keep them so like you look here in shallow in that top center yes. in the screen there's a large area that's just mobile home uh, overlay and that allows for more like a double wide so the double wide there's two actual overlay districts a community which allows for the parks and the double wide on individual lot and then there's just mobile home overlay just the mh and that allows basically a double wide that's all it allows on an individual lot so you have to have that masonry skirting um kind of a four by one whatever limit on the length and usually some sort of like residential type materials like shingle roof final siding so there's some design standards that are allowed by state law on end on our restrictions for individual lots which brings me to do yes. you have to comply with the landscape and design standards 7113 in the um, uh, mobile home uh, park park yeah so the mobile home community overlay if you were to create a new park there are some specific design standards related to manufactured housing parks and there, so there are some buffering and landscaping standards the truth is i haven't reviewed or seen a new park come through the city since i've been here i believe the last one that came through was in the emma area in the former etj off of emma road there might be that one if you ride out on emma road before you get to emma there's a little bit of a stretch of sidewalk by itself that was it and then the other one is let me see here let's roll this way the large dark area that large black one at the bottom that is wellington estates that come through the cz several years ago maybe five six years ago is a cz mm -hmm. there was an expansion to that one that mobile home community so that was done as like a highway business cz for a mobile home community so that was another way they went that's probably the only place in my life on only compliant conforming park in the city is that one and did that CZ uh, trigger due to the size increase or the zoning, uh, uh, where the sitting zoning was? That one I probably better not say because I didn't handle the rezoning, and that's, again, about five years or six years ago. But it, it was highway business, probably the expansion that, you know, you get over 50 units, most of the time you have to have a CZ. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments or you all you all feel okay about this going forward can i say that oh. okay because i do have a line ready in my pnz report so as i present it to NAC, and this is what they said so okay thank you so much thank you thank you we appreciate that sure thank you very much do you have a card or something you can leave with us I don't have a card. We, I don't have cards. Ms. Summerall just had to read the mail with me. Uh, I can't bring them to me. Well, can we put them Sure. Okay. They're getting to us. I'm blushing. I tried to form that crazy action. That's okay. Um. I don't have anything for the NAC um, member information sharing unless not from uh, multimodal from Elizabeth and Sharon. Did you have anything that you wanted to talk no, about? No, we were uh, uh, off for the month, so no. Nothing. Anyone else over here? Tell me about your community while we're here. Come on, Peter. I know you have something to say. <laughs> Not really about it. You it's, don't? Everything is fine and um, getting better all the time. Okay. As you say. I do have something to say about uh, Easton Valley, which is my neighborhood, even though I represent 28805. Um, we have concerns with the new South Slope uh, uh, design, change, overlay. I'm not even sure it's called an overlay. And um, I went to a uh, 
chamber of commerce meeting that they had where they showed what the changes in the, um, oh, uh, which will include South Slope, which is Mountainside Park, uh, McCormick Field, and uh, uh, Memorial Stadium. And our community has some concerns um, about it going into uh, CBD commercial business. And so I do believe that Sasha's handling this, and I, I do believe that we're going to have a meeting with Oakley, uh, Easton Valley, and South French Broad regarding this new uh, uh, design plan so we can air the community's concerns. She's aware that she's received our emails on it, and um, and that's coming to council, I believe, in October. Can I address that? Is that okay? Uh -huh. I'm just walking up here like, um, yeah, so we will delay that. Frankly, part of the problem is I just have two jobs right now and I'm, I've been spending all my time on housing stuff. And so I haven't had the opportunity to really talk to the neighborhood. So it is gonna get delayed just because we don't want, you know, nothing, and I heard some conversation, nothing's happening. <laughs> That's part of the problem, nothing's happening because I'm just so busy. But yeah, I'm definitely coming to talk to the neighborhood. So. so it's getting delayed further past the, the October. past October 11th. I don't know if we can make October 25th or not, mm -hmm. but I think I, overall, like some of the bigger neighbor, some of the, there's several concerns that I think are very easy to address. Let's put it that way. And um, really, just so maybe everybody knows this, but just to say it out loud. Um, you know, vision plans are general guiding documents. They don't have any binding effect. So if there's like a zoning proposition or an idea in a plan, it's an idea. And I guess it does mean something to everybody if council adopts it, and I get that. But um, it will always require staff to come back to the community and discuss any rezonings before anything actually happens. Right. So because they're fairly complicated in a way, if you think about, um, where commercial districts meet neighborhoods, right? So property owners who own the commercial property are banking on a certain amount of height or something, and neighborhoods are kind of hoping to not be impacted by development. So it's how do we strike that balance for both? So. Thank you for explaining that. Sure. Anybody else have any questions? Go ahead. Wendy, I don't think you need to sit down right now. Oh, well, that's okay. I don't think you do because Wendy has something. She's getting ready to ask questions. That's all right. Um, while you were asking about neighborhood reports, and okay, okay, okay. she's going to. So that's what I was going to address. Okay, I was going to ask you. I know that you're on it, and she said before you go on, that I'll tell about you. It was about when you're talking about the economic development, the affordable housing division, and I know you're talking about mobile home ordinances. Um, do you also, uh, what we're seeing in our community is that developers are coming in to our neighborhood because um, of the affordability to get the land. Right. And they're now they're trying to um, come into our neighborhood with um, commercial properties that they're trying to get rezoned um, that's in a residence. Oh, uh -huh. Um, I don't know, and, and we're concerned about the ones that are um, building in divisions where they found land. They're saying it's only a certain amount of footage apart from each house that has to be. Did that change from what it used to be? I don't think so. I mean, the building code hasn't really changed. I mean, I think. So how much feet apart should they be? I mean, it depends on what you're building and what your zoning district is. I mean, I would say that, you know, we've got, if you're a townhome, you can be right up next to each other. They can share a wall and that property, there's a property line there that influences building code and how fire code is enforced. If you're on two separate lots, there is a minimum distance and that's building code. And really it's, it's all about um, fires jumping from building to building is partly what's directing that in building code, to my understanding. Um, now, and then there's the zoning, right? So mm -hmm. um, in RM8 and maybe RS8, the minimum side setback is six feet, I believe, right? I think that's... Um, I haven't lost all my planning knowledge yet. <laughs> but um, I will tell you that, you know, planners are very aware of, in, in, in our department and probably Ricky's too, um, that 
how the Shiloh community feels and that you all oh, yeah. are never afraid to say anything. And so if, you know, when we get, when we have early assistance meetings or pre-application meetings, we will often say like your first stop needs to be the neighborhood. And if it's something clearly we know like commercial, proposing a rezoning from to commercial in a residential neighborhood, we often say they're not gonna, be, you know, we don't think they're gonna be, we're, we try not to speak for people, right? But Shiloh has, for, for sure, Shiloh has let us know they're not on board with this. It's when people can do things by right, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's and planners can't stop anything. That's the difficult thing. And, and the state legislature took away the ability for, for ordinances to regulate design of homes. I know in Shiloh, often people talk about porches and wind, maybe even windows. And those are things we can't regulate unless it's more than like three or four residences in one building. So, so I, the reason why I said that is because it does look like that the people that are coming into our community that are building, they're using that, you know, we're supposed to be six feet. Of, of, and that is really close. Plus, in Shiloh, being a small residential area, we don't have the fire hydrants. So that means that if there's a fire at this house, it's going to impact the next house before the fire department can get around and mm -hmm. try to, to find space to come into, uh, you know, to even stop that. So we've had that happen with the lodge in Shiloh. And we wonder if maybe that might have been a reason because there was no fire hydrant close to that. And the one that would have been able to give them a throughway, a man had a house and he built a garage apartment and then he built another house and it's right on the back side of my church. And so where the fire department could have come up in between the church and the other property, it can't come that way. So when there's a fire, then you have a complicated, you have an issue <clears throat> of them using their water supply or even trying to figure out where, where the hydrant is to try to, you know, to get it together. So we have that, we have that type of an issue. And I know that you all have no concern about it, but we have, where I live, there's um, my son and I have a house. And then there was, it was two properties and they were put, and we were gifted a portion of that property. So there's a house here and our house is here. So they sold my aunt's house, but now we're having a problem with, they sold it to the people that say, I build, uh, I buy ugly homes because the house is not worth really getting a realtor to come. So they've tried to go back, um, they've tried to do things without getting the proper permits. So we have to call them on it because, and they're telling us it's, it's, a, it's a job. And so I understand what you all go through because we're having to manage this ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because when they, whenever we see them come, and they came, yes, the guy came yesterday, and every time we turn around, they're trying to say that the property line, there's no record of it, and then we know it is, and then it's been surveyed. But I asked them, have you surveyed it? And they said, no, we haven't been had the time for it. Do you have a permit to do what you're doing? And they said, well, no, it's taking longer. So we're seeing those kind of things happening in our neighborhood where people develop us. And he's coming to get the house and he's going to flip it because he's not going to live in it. And then it wasn't until I told him he couldn't do an Airbnb because it was in the city. So that went away. Um, but I mean, it's, I think it's the educational process. Yeah. And, and so, you know, like Sasha said, there's the plane department and I'm down in the DSD. So if you have anybody in your community that's concerned about like what's going on with a piece of property or where like even like this I buy, buy ugly houses, whoever is yeah. inquiring about your property, we'll be glad to talk to you about the zoning and what are the allowed uses. So I like to make sure that if somebody's selling their property, um, especially with, you know, historically African American community, communities that are kind of targeted sometimes now with investment to make sure people are know what they got before they start uh, selling property to the first person that shows up. So I always tell people to find a trusted real estate agent to help them. But in the case too, I think a lot of Shiloh is there's RSA that's closer to I-40 on Brooklyn. And uh, a large portion of the community is RS4. So it's, you know, 10 foot side setbacks, uh, 8,000 square foot lots. Um, but if you build an ADU, 
you're still six feet off the side rear. Um, and then if you build, you know, like Sasha said, if it's like a cottage development or townhomes, if you build multiple houses on the same parcel, you only have to have six feet between them individually because the building code only mandates three feet from an imaginary property line. So they can be six feet apart, not six feet from the property line. That's the zoning thing. Mm -hmm. So there, it gets confusing when you have all these inner different disciplines. They're all kind of like filters. You're trying to see through like sift flour and you use what you get at the bottom. But, uh, you know, because there is, and the fire marshal, they don't look at one, two family dwellings. They'll look at a major subdivision. So when there's brand new construction with roads, the fire marshal will evaluate that new road. But see, they're not looking at individual one, two family dwellings. So, you know. Concerns about fire hydrants. Yeah, I would say you probably want to talk to water engineering. That's in the permit center building. I would start with them. Chad Pierce is the section supervisor over that. Uh, that'd be a good person to start with to find out, you know, what the where the infrastructure's at and how it lays out. You know, especially if you're concerned about fire response time. Even if you're not building another house down there, you probably want to make sure where those hydrants are at. So that that was that was a concern, yeah. I know in the in the neighborhood about people, um, and then when I talk when you talk when we talk to developers, then they say that people are not concerned about how much property they have on the outside; they just want a house on the inside. Mm -hmm. So you know, a house, and so they're not giving they're not giving value to property. So so like the house that I have now, they could easily put three houses on. Potentially depends on yeah, yeah. geometry. And, and so what they're doing now is on uh, my side of Rocky Road with Oakley, there's a there are two houses that are like towers, two big towers, mm -hmm. and there was a little bitty house in the middle. But they bought the property, so that's what they did. But it was I don't know how we would get a standard order for how tall they could build a house. Yeah. Uh, in the area. So yeah. I don't know what those and, and I'll answer. I don't want to get too wild in the code, but. We measure height, what I call in the valley floor. So below the 2350 elevation contour line, we actually measure height about four or five different ways in the city. So <laughs> there's one way to measure it downtown. There's a different way to measure it in the Haywood Road corridors. And then there's a different way on the mountainsides above 2350. Sharon knows all about it. And then there's another way on the valley floor. So for me, most of the time we're measuring on the fire department axis of the building, so the front door, it's from the elevation, the natural grade, to the highest finished ceiling of the highest occupied floor. So if you had a vaulted ceiling, then the peak on the inside, the sheet rocks where I'm gonna measure to the 40. If you've got a flat ceiling and you got a nice big attic, that's where I'm measuring to the flat. So you can build a three-story house under the residential code. I'm not a building code official, but when you hit four stories, not a basement, four stories, it kicks you over to the commercial code when you get four stories. So people can build a 35-foot tall, tall three-story house that's 35 foot tall on the front, and it could be 45, 47 feet on the back side mm -hmm. of that, and then you got these large gable roofs. So it's how you measure height, and so, and then when you're six feet off the side property line or something, then that, if you got a narrow long house that's right door, next door to you on the south side, you get a lot of shade. So th that's kind of the rules we got. You know, it, it doesn't work so bad, but when you get a big tall house, some people call them bird boxes, it gets like that. Okay. But if you want to stop by one day, let us know. We'll pass on to Christina our contact information. I'll be glad to you want to stop and we'll go through the individual situations you want to talk through about how does this happen because the more that you're in the community and if you understand what we're doing or what the rules are then it can make sense you might not like it but you at least understand and then if there's a conversation with the legislative body about changing rules then the community can work through that so what i'm saying is i'm doing all of this yeah not for myself yes ma'am but i'm doing it because um for some reason, we have been behind behind the scenes of not knowing what processes are and what people can do. And so I'm getting this information. So I will send my son to you. Okay. Because I would want him to know 
because he lives in a community too. Yes, so ma'am. It, it, so he's, he, today, instead of me doing it for him, yes, ma'am. he's 39 years old. Yes, ma'am. So instead of the mother doing it, yeah. him and his wife, they can go. And so he did contact um, someone today. And he was excited because he made two calls and he gave us some information. Okay. That's what I want to do. I always want to make sure I can pass something on for somebody else to know. Yeah. So, so if you if you have anything in your community, you're welcome to call a planner of the day, the zoning hotline at 828-259-5450. You can you can call that and you can also email us at POD. That's Polly Planner of the Day, POD at Asheville NC, one word Asheville NC dot G O V. And so I get to copy of those emails. I have a staff member that is on deck every day for that, but also get a copy. So if you have to say, I want to try to chase Ricky down, uh, okay. you can do that. And then if not, like I say, Sharon will come in and jerk a nod at me and she'll find me for you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The information. We appreciate Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it was it's just about 28804 and uh, we've got the Grace neighborhood going uh, with the playground and uh, Asheville City finally has approved that and we're excited about it. But tomorrow night, Asheville City Council has to approve it. So I will be there um, as I have always been following through with the Grace playground. Um, also, um, I've been following up with all the neighborhoods that had received our grants. And we had Lakeview Park, we had Grace, and we had Norwood. Uh, Norwood um, wanted to have their stairs fixed that go between um, Norwood up to their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And that has not, they haven't even started on it yet. So I, I'm kind of concerned about some of the grant dollars that have been issued and not seeing um, any movement. So if there was something that we could do to help them along or to see what's holding them up, that would be really great. Um, and then of course, this road diet over on Merriman is killing me. It's just, the people are just up in arms. Oh, it's just hard. I understand. I'm with you because we we have it too. We have it. I mean, it's but on uh, Merriman Avenue. Oh, you, you should don't travel on Hendersonville Road. Or so oh, I know Hendersonville Road. Right. Right. Because you will be waiting. It's bad. I don't go. Almost I don't go got. Out at that time. I was okay. walking across the street in front of my house. I live right on Kimberly, and I was waiting for the light to change, and <laughs> it changed to red, and a um, pizza. Papa John's Pizza ran the red light and came about four inches from hitting me. This road diet is supposed to be safer for pedestrians, actually, <laughs> by creating more space well, with the bike lane and the sidewalk. So but when you have 42% of the actual police <laughs> gone, we need to look at getting traffic lights and cameras to help them because at 42 percent of the Asheville Police Department gone, then we need to have something to monitor this traffic. The only drawback to that is because my daughter lives in Maryland, Annapolis, Maryland. That's a good idea, but you know what the traffic lights do? They only take your picture and your drivers and your um, license, license plate, plate and they send you a bill. Mm -hmm. So it does not. But you, the more the bills they get, the more they're registered on their list. And they'll then, pay them. They'll pay them. The people that, that get them, like the person you said. That was well, it'd be an income coming into the city, and hopefully it would help with all these other issues mm -hmm. that we've got expenses for. You are correct. So, that was all I have. for my neighborhoods. Okay. I changed my mind. I won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so kudos, I guess, to the water department. Uh, they did some major work um, in our community, uh, replacing and reconstructing the drainage, um, tearing up the roads, put them, putting them nicely back together and paved them nicely. So it's great, but the net effect has been the elimination of flooding uh, Chun's Cove and Mountain View. So um, they did a great job. So 
I just wanted to end. Everybody's pleased. We have Kim Long here. Did, would you like to say anything today? Oh, just that I'm really glad to be here with y'all. Mm -hmm. Glad to have you. Glad to see you here. Okay. It is now 726. Let's get on a table. We'll be ready for our next meeting, mm -hmm. which will be October the 24th. Yes, ma'am. Um, we need to pick a date. I believe I asked Christina to find uh, whether our time was going to be late again from six, because it's two hours, six to eight, and um, to see if there was any other times that we wanted to do it earlier that this room was available. It's not. Yeah, it's supposed to be until 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30